Hi, thank you everyone for joining us tonight, both virtually and live in person. It's been two years since Cures hosted an event in person, so it's very exciting. Um, but before we begin tonight's event, we have a couple of groups and organizations we wanna thank. Um, first, we wanna thank the Westchester County Board of Legislatures for funding the second annual Five Towns One Book event, specifically Catherine Parker, who's been an early and consistent supporter of Cures work. Cure has also partnered with LMC Media, the Westchester Library System, and the County Human Rights Commission. We're grateful to be working with our five host libraries, Harrison, Largemont, Mamaroneck, New Rochelle, and Rye. And tonight we give a shout out to Rye's librarian, Chris Shoemaker. Thank you. In addition, this year, we've partnered with 20 other Westchester County libraries that have signed up to promote Heather McGee's book, The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. And this event in their communities, in addition to participating in their own truth, racial healing, and transformation work inspired by the book. Since it's our first event, we want to start by defining the two major concepts that Ms. McGee introduces in her book. We understand that many of you may not have read the book, so we want to really hone in onto these two concepts. The first is the zero-sum theory, which she defines as where many white Americans view race as a zero sum game, there's an us and a them. And what's good for them is bad for us. This rationale animates our public policies even today. When those who benefit from our country's drastic economic inequality sell the zero sum story to block public support for any collective action that benefits us all, from universal health care to living wages. However, if we can break away from this thinking, we can achieve her second concept, which is a solidarity dividend, where Americans reaching across racial lines work together for the common good and securing better lives for us all. Tonight's events highlights chapter eight, The Same Sky, which focuses on environmental racism and environmental justice movement. Now I understand that some of these concepts might be new, so I'd like to define what race, environmental racism is. Environmental racism is generally defined as an intentional or unintentional racial discrimination in environmental policy making, enforcement of regulations and laws, and targeting communities of color for the disposal of toxic waste and the location of pollution industries. Now, this is a very general term, but if you can think of things like zoning laws and where things are placed, you can see environmental racism throughout our communities. Environmental racism, ha environmental racism has led to the environmental justice movement, which focuses on the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Tonight, I'm joined by two amazing individuals who are leaders in the area, Jennifer Mitchell and Paul Prisendu. We ask the audience to hold their questions for them until the end when we'll have a Q&A session. So, Jen, Paul, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself, how you found yourself drawn to this area and your respective organization? I'm going to let Jen go first. Sure. Um, thank you so much. And thank you, Cure, and all the library systems for having me here tonight. I'm Jennifer Mitchell. I am the executive director of a nonprofit called the HOPE Program. We are a nearly 40-year-old nonprofit that works in all five boroughs with sites in Brooklyn and the Bronx, and we do green jobs training. So we are training folks in local communities to do work to um, to improve their own skill set, but also improve the lives of their of their families and their communities. Um, and as by way of introduction, I wanted to kind of uh, tell why I got involved in this work. Uh, so over over 25 years ago, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Bluefields, Nicaragua. I had majored in environmental policy in college, and I was sent down to Bluefields, Nicaragua to do environmental education. And when doing environmental education, I was in Nicaragua was at that time and probably still is the second poorest country in the Western hemisphere and um, Bluefields was one of the poorer communities in Nicaragua and um, doing environmental education meant asking people to worry about 
the environment and the future. Um, and it was about asking people who were struggling to put food on their table and to provide for their families to worry about environmental things that felt like very long-term and very abstract. Um, and it was a struggle. And so when I came back from the Peace Corps, I kind of shifted gears uh, and went to grad school and got involved in what, what we could, it's not a commonly known term, but we call workforce development. So the business of helping people to get the training and the network and the skills and the confidence they need to get a job, keep a job and build a career. Uh, and then 10 years ago, I was fortunate enough to um, join two organizations together, one that was worried about workforce development and one that was worried about environmental justice and environmental racism. Um, and so now together, um, those organizations run green workforce development um, programs all over New York City. Um, and for me, it's like a win, 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 right? You're getting people to be able to put food on their table and provide for their families while gaining skills that will make a difference in the future and help us build a new, inclusive, equitable green economy. And so I'm thrilled to be here tonight. Um, I'm obsessed with Heather McGee and can't wait to talk about the same sky. <laughs> How about you, Paul? Yeah. So. Um... My name is Paul Presidio, Presidio Cuesta. I'm from New Rochelle, New York, original land of the Lenape people. Um, and um, I just wanted to revalue the opportunity. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this forward thinking dialogue and really talk about not only this book, but how we could really localize some of the insight that we received within the pages of text. Um, I first always give a shout out to, um, I'm a son of two immigrants. My mother's from Cali, Colombia. Father's a singer in Haiti. So, um, everything that I do is my American dream is on their forefront. You know, yeah. you know, she's telling me as well. And, um, and you do an amazing work through the you know, Community Resource Center as the executive director. Thank you for being here. And also, I'll give a shout out to my friend Jonathan Nuaro. He's the regional organizer for the Energy Justice Network, which is helping us transition from the waste incineration through zero waste programming and the environmental economics to show that we can go green by also going green. Um, I'm really happy um, to really be part of this conversation. I, right now, I'm the outreach manager for the state of Westchester, uh, which is a county's nonprofit consortium for 44 local governments to support our renewable energy transition through lens of equity. Our 44 municipal governments, not all of them have the economic bandwidth to hire a sustainability coordinator or have um, members of the community that have the social economic bandwidth to volunteer for 10 hours, 15 hours a week to help with that renewable energy transition. So it's important that we all come together throughout our intermunicipal lines because we're all in this together, you know, one ship going around the sun, going through the Milky Way galaxy with the Milky Way galaxy going through what we call the observable universe. Um, I think that with this conversation that we're able to have, it's gonna be very profound because it's really, you know, you can look at three people that are talking about EJ, you could probably look at this as kind of really like a, a section of like a United Nations General Assembly. <laughs> you know, just different backgrounds, different perspectives and different expertise. And I'll say hearing about what you're doing back when I was, uh, um, an aspiring professional video game player. <laughs> really okay, you just made me feel really old. <laughs> but uh, it really shows that, you know, that we're all like, you know, we're all doing what we can within the, the movement, um, which is addressing environmental justice issues. Um, this is something I'm very passionate about. Um, um, I'll be honest with you, I, um, I said that I talked to my friend John before. Um, I lost my mother when I was four months old, sitting near Rochelle. Um, a tree fell on her, a uh, flash storm. And it was a normal sunny day. My grandma would say, don't go out there. My older brother, you know, he's the Prince of Wales in my house. He's like, I want to go outside. I want to go outside. So I'll do what he wants. And uh, storm came, tree fell on her, four months old. And uh, now I'm the chairman of the city of North Shell's Environment Advisory Committee, you know, and I have tree board coordinators that report to me. And um, it shows that if we don't do what we can now, the simple measures of it, you know, arbor, like a, a, having a city arborist, um, you know, having sewage mitigation strategies, having flood mitigation strategies, um, making sure that we're addressing air quality, you know, city of Peaks is over 60% of people of color, but the hazard rates are over 50% for new people. You know, these are things that are out there and that we need to address. Otherwise, we're going to continue to really um, damage the frameworks that are, have, that are out there. So I'm lucky my father was able to find another, uh, another true love and my stepmother. The past 17 years of my life, I had an Asian stepmom telling me to take off my shoes when I come inside. <laughs> um, that's not a luxury for a lot of young people out there, you know. Um, I, I tell us all the time, you know, it's funny, John is here. John and I, we met when we were in the Boy Scouts of America uh, in 2004, and I'm like, wow, so the Black guy here lost <laughs> I, I 
because I'm comfortable. Like uh, my friends are telling me I'm not black because I'm in the Boy Scouts. Like, oh, you're not really black. You know? <laughs> and for me to, you know, be with John years later, he stopped by here before he goes to a Young Democrats meeting. It means a lot uh, because he's so it's in the movement with me and a person of color where we can kind of show how does it, how do we build allies without showing the people that we culturally resonate with that we're not cold switching. That's the right term, right? That's, That's the right it. term. <laughs> so, um, um, thank you all of you for this opportunity to be here. Um, look forward to talking about this book. You know, it, you know, we all share the same sky, you know, share the same air, drink the same water. It's just about where, um, you know, the creator pulled us, put us on this earth when they rolled the dice. So uh, let's get to work and look forward to a great conversation. Thank you. So um, one of the first things we wanted to go into was um, when you're going through the book, uh, The Same Sky, you know, Miss McGee talks about communicating with different work groups, um, how you talk to your communities. She specifically talks about the Yale project on climate change communication, where fewer than 25% of white people said that they were willing to join a campaign to convince their government to act on climate change. And then two pages before that, she discusses how only in the United States does our conservative party with very few exceptions, flat out deny that there's a problem when comparing the conservative party here to ones outside the United States. How do you deal with those issues? You both work in communities, you deal with different groups of people. How do you deal with when certain groups in the community just don't want to hear what you have to say or even want to acknowledge that there's an environmental problem? So I'm gonna start with Paul and with you at this one. Wow. Um, yeah, sorry, can you, can you hear me better now? Okay, awesome, can you hear me better now? Oh, okay, awesome, yeah, yeah. Just, sorry about that, let me just go like this. Yeah, can you guys hear better? Okay, awesome. Does that work? Um, I'll, I'll be really like straightforward. It's really about diversity and equity. I'm from New Rochelle. I have no, no, no um, business telling people in Mount Vernon what to do. I can't tell people in Southwest Yonkers what to do. Doesn't matter how well I speak Spanish, I can't tell people in Port Chester what to do, you know? Mm -hmm. It's really about seeing who are the people that are already there in the movement and how, what can I do to really uplift or upscale their, their um, I guess their bandwidth. Um, it's really about not reinventing the wheel. Um, from the problem that, for program that we're doing with the state of Westchester, it's really about us really creating that inter-municipal framework by uniting not only municipal leaders on government, but also the environmental advisors. How do we talk to um, a member of the city of Mount Vernon's tree advisory committee and provide them the same level of attention um, that we're providing to um, the city of Rye's sustainability committee? Um, because um, these are, because if you if be honest, the city of Mount Vernon doesn't even have a sustainability committee. They only have a tree advisory committee. So if I could talk to the city of Rye and learn what they're doing, I could then go back to Mount Vernon and show them the infrastructure and the programs available in Mount Vernon. So city of Mount Vernon joined the state of Westchester in 2019, and now they're looking at um, programming for nice service climate smart communities and clean energy communities program. And that was us, that was with me not only trying to just go into Mount Verde and say, Mary Sean Patterson Howard, you're supposed to do this, supposed to do that, you're supposed to do that. It's by listening and finding out what the issues are. Where are the places that people are suffering from indoor air quality issues? Where are the places where sewage lines are being shut down? Where are the neighborhood associations that have people that can put up, that can get on the Zoom for 30, um, for 30 people on the Zoom to talk about these issues? So I don't have to chase around and, and chase, chase a tail in the middle of COVID and try and convince people that I'm here to help when I can just build surrogates from the Crestwood neighbor, I mean, through the um, Fleetwood Neighbor Association. Clark well, Crestwood is Yonkers. I'm going to get into Yonkers for a second. Crestwood's <laughs> 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 Yonkers, you know? You know yeah, and um, it's, it's really about building those allies. And it's important that you build those allies so you can avoid some misinformation that's happening out here. You know, it takes a lot of privilege after work to be able to go on next door and complain about something that you did not even research in terms of community energy programming, in terms of sustainable initiatives, <laughs> um, in terms of saying climate change is real, go fossil fuels. You know, these are issues that really are impacting all of us. And, you know, um, in the book, I, I remember they were mentioning how this, the situation that occurred in, um, with um, the Senate president for the, um, the state of Oregon State Senate, um, Senate, Senate President Courtney, and how are you the state senator and you can't even call a vote for climate change, but uh. you could Google search forest fires in Oregon and you could see the frequency of how much they picked up since Senator Courtney took the president's gavel in the Senate in 2003. So it's really important that um, not only are we able to micro-target the, the, the loud minority of people 
um, because it, these programming is really about all of us, especially for the equitable uh, representation of the renewable energy transitions. Otherwise, we're going to continue to see um, all this great um, ags of green zones and these affluent communities, but we're not going to see the communities that really need them. Um, and Community Solar is a great program I know State of Washington has been working on, and that's a program where people that don't even have roofs could have scrapped a nearby solar farm and have a solar credit check or reflect on their a discount. And that's for people in Mount Vernon, multifamily homes in these municipalities that are living in the inner city community that are have, don't have the ability to talk to their landlord and don't have the ability to have solar panels to start on their property. So there's a lot of potential in terms of equity and, and inclusion, but it's really about us being able to relationship build through uh, the righteous platform and really showing people the program works. And sometimes you got to show them the solution and let them realize the problems that's preventing them. And it's really about longstanding social economics, but people do get it as long as you're willing to find someone that could be your liaison or your peer mediator mm -hmm. to help say, hey, these people know what they're doing. They could be trusted. And, you know, we live here too. So so these, these are the ways you got to do the relationship building through the lens of equity. I just want to um, piggyback on what you were saying, though, when we, when we Touched a little bit on Yonkers, but didn't go too far into it. Oh, wow. So <laughs> I'll see her now. Right? She's I, going there now. <laughs> I know that sometimes yeah. um, if you could wow. show even that they're, yeah, they're hurting their own financial interests yeah, so. by saying that I'm against this by a talking point with misinformation. So I would first say that the narrative's changed. You know, you have some people that historically have come through backgrounds and upbringings where Government has no business helping with renewable energy, helping with climate agendas. You know, government's just supposed to be there for, um, I guess, ribbon cutting, new store, um, you know, or for, you know, uh, handing out diplomas at a high school graduation and things like that. You don't realize that, you know, climate change to address it, it's going to have to take an interminable framework of local leaders to address this global threat. Because the solution that we have here in Westchester is not the solutions that could work in Bangladesh where creating floating schools because people don't walk three feet, three feet of flood water. You know, um, I, I became aware about this because I became a global ambassador for the United Nations Association for the 13th State of Development Bowl. And I've been jumping on Zoom with these people and being like, wow, you know, we need to curb our carbon emissions. Otherwise, those communities can be impacted. City of Yonkers, third largest city, state of New York. They're, they are emitting so much carbon that the only way you could offset that is through a lens of environmental economics. We showed the feasibility and we created a community energy program, which is going well. The rollout is in March. The Westchester Power, which is active in 20 municipalities, is active in the city of Rye. Residents of Rye, if you want to join the community energy program, you can get a fixed rate of clean electricity at 6.75 cents a kilowatt. The Con Edison rate was at 16.9 cents a kilowatt in January. So please consider that transition. I wanted to promote that. And what's so unfortunate with the city of Yonkers is that you have people that are living um, with a high, high level of economic vulnerability. You have people that are making ends meet. They're probably working overtime. Um, I remember um, being in meetings with City Council Majority Leader Tasha Diaz and hearing about residents that are living in buildings with rodent infestations, like where a third of their bathroom ceiling has mold on it. Um, so there are people that really do not have the bandwidth of going through the New York State Power to Choose website, looking through the renewable energy options that are out there, then going through the New York State Generation Attribute Tracking System to make sure the electricity supply is coming from the green source that they're coming from. That's it's a lot of people. Most people can't even read their kind of bill. And, um, but, but there's an emboldened, um, there's, there's an emboldened type of nature from certain members of society that they don't realize their level of ignorance. They don't realize the research that's needed to be a part of that, that marketplace of ideas for forward thinking solutions. And these people have been impacted misinformation campaigns, um, but the narrative has changed. You know, we have been working with, um, with the Crestwood Public Library, so I mentioned that before, we had community information sessions with them. We have been working with the Yonkers Office of Aging to get the information out to seniors. We made contacts with, you know, municipal housing authorities because it's important that we get that information out. And it's unfortunate because you can look at the demographics of the people that are making um, the, um, the noise that are saying, these are people probably that could care less about um, how much you're paying their electricity bill. And I'll be honest with you, you know, they could probably care less. They're probably so affluent that they probably have an automatic charge that's that's going to their bank account east of and things like that. So. Um, with the situation young, just to really wrap it up, because I realized I'm ranting a little bit, because it's something that really did <laughs> help me grow a lot, because it showed that there is a little bit of partisanship that's happening here. It's not about who has a solution, it's what, the, you know, what's the color uh, after their last name? 
Who wants to be, who wants to run for mayor in two, two, in two years? Who wants to uh, be the next state assemblyman? These are things that people are bringing, and it's unfortunate bringing politics. It's a global government. You know, Yonkers. When I think about Yonkers, I think about Hurricane Ida. I'm thinking about people where you know people going down the street and they find a giant crater. You know, I'm thinking about people that are, have trees and power lines that are knocked out. I'm thinking about property damage. I'm thinking about people that are waking up and they're noticing that they have four feet of flood water. And the only way that you could decarbonize is through community energy program. Residents Yonkers can get renewable energy at 8.7 8.7 cents a kilowatt. Residents um, of Yonkers could get, if they don't want the renewable energy in your state hydropower, if you don't want to pay less than 16.9 for the green supply, you could get the standard option. That's going to be, that, that's going to be um, vetted at 7.257 cents a kilowatt. It's for the standard. Similar to the and supply, but it's standard. Um, but some people don't don't want to agree to that. And some of these people claim to be fiscal conservatives. Some of the people that are claimed to be caring about their constituents, they're rather perpetuating a little bit of misinformation. And some it's not their fault. It's historical backgrounds, people don't understand issues that they, you know, some people like to have tangible problems, you know, in terms of like that supervisor that annoys them in the cubicle, or, you know, or that, um, or, or that boss that is disingenuous to provide them with that vacation time and things like that. Climate change is a big issue for a lot of people, but you do have to go through that ego death experience to be able to do the research so that you're not a blockade for the marketplace of ideas. Because if you tell people what resources that are available to them, it's all about optional program with this electricity supply program for decarbonization, stabilize our weather patterns. It's really about people having options, having liberty, having freedom to not be dependent on a single entity for electricity supply while gaining the educational resources to Go through nice sort of power to choose website and look at other real energy suppliers and go through the New York State Generation Attribute Tracking System to vet the electricity supply for these escos that are soliciting letters that are coming to your inbox. So, um, you know, when, when I talk about in, um, in climate, climate change, it has to be done through a uh, lens of education. I'm very big on youth empowerment. Frederick Douglass once said, Black History Month, um, it's, better, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. So if you're bringing, if you're teaching people in the K-12 system about climate change and what it means to protect our air and what's been happening over time, you might have to show them a couple of um, sea turtles choking on some plastic rings. You might have to show them a couple of seagulls that died because their bellies exploded from plastic. These are real things that are happening. You have to give that visualization so they're not throwing plastic bottles into the garbage and things like that. These are the people that if you then provide that information, they will have that infrastructure stewardship so that when a letter is coming about renewable energy, they'll be um, more inclined to do the research and do the economic assessment to see that it works, even if they're not a tree hugger, because they're able to save more money and be able to buy book bags for their kids when school comes up next year. All right. Thank you, Paul. Um, sounds like basically it saves you money also to go green. <laughs> it's half your con end, though. Um, it's competitive pricing by us coming together. Exactly. Uh, Jen, same question to you regarding how you deal with uh, speaking to different communities and what you do. Um, well, I would say that I am really fortunate compared to Paul because I'm working in communities. I, so I live in Mamaroneck, um, and the community that I spend the most time in for my job is Hunts Point, which is in the South Bronx. Um, and the folks that live in Hunts Point know exactly what is going on. Hunts Point is one of those communities that has, you know, 15,000 trucks going in and out causing air pollution. It has three expressways. There's pollution from that. There's waterways that are polluted. Um, there are the highest rates of asthma in the city and probably in the state. And so my job and, and in my role um, running green workforce development programs it's less about convincing people um, that there is a problem going on, but elevating the voices of community members. And I think Paul alluded to that um, when he's talking about building allies and building constituents and building credible messengers. They need to be people from the community. And so um, in Hunts Point, there is no shortage of credible messengers. And so it's really about partnering and building trust and bringing resources in um, and then doing finding solutions that work and then all doing it together. Um, you know, Heather McGee talked about, as you alluded to, the zero sum game about how people believe if somebody is, else is winning, it means somebody else has to be losing. And the thing that um, 
and I'm probably going to get the numbers wrong, but she said something like if the United States had decided to solve the racial wealth gap 20 years ago, then as a country, we would be, I think it was something like $16 billion wealthier. That means everybody would have won. And, and that whole idea of like going green and saving money um, is also like, like understanding that like diversity of opinion and diversity of people and working together makes everybody better and stronger. And so, and so that's a lot of the work we do. And I know we're going to get into it later, but there's, you know, programs we run where we're painting rooftops white to mitigate both like buildings themselves to become more energy efficient, which saves money also. And then also mitigating the urban heat island effect. Because if you have a white rooftop, the whole, and you have enough square feet of white rooftop, the whole um, area or neighborhood can be cooler. And so these are like low tech environmental solutions um, that we're doing in places like Hunts Point that we then get calls from folks in other neighborhoods saying, hey, how do I get a white rooftop? Um, and so I think, you know, Paul talked about like the credible messengers and the allies and the elevating the voices of the people impacted. I also think um, there's the element of like making it personal um, and, and showing people how it's not impacting somebody across the globe, though I would argue you should care about that too. Um, but it's impacting someone, your neighbor, your, you know, and and it's not Westchester, but Hunt Point, I live in Mamaroneck. My office in Hunt Point is 21 minutes away. This is, this is, we are all neighbors. We are all in this together. Um, and so, you know, that whole idea of like, finding allies, building trust, um, and then doing the work together is really powerful. Yeah, pollution travels. It doesn't stay any, it doesn't yeah. stay within one community. So it impacts everybody. Um, so I want to go on to the next question. Um, Ms. McGee goes into the big greens and the missed opportunities in engaging communities specifically stating, the same power structures that advantage white people in the world are advantaging white people in advocacy field. And the cost of that is, the, is that the field is not seeing where their biggest untapped basis for organizing. Have either of you come across issues with missed opportunities? So you've worked with bigger organizations, with government, with municipalities, and you've seen these missed opportunities. I'm gonna let you go first, Jen, if you've seen sure. anything like this. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's interesting. And I had never heard until I read the book, the term big greens. And, and for folks who haven't read the book, what she meant by big greens is like the big kind of national level environmental policy organizations um, and kind of what they're focusing on. And so you hear campaigns about save the whales or um, save the polar bears or mm -hmm. save the rainforest. And, and, and so there are these big kind of global threats that big, what she terms, or I think other people's term also, big greens are worrying about. And I think that the missed opportunity is that there are local issues that need to be brought to light and there are local voices that need to be elevated. And so, it, and, and frankly, I mean, it, again, in the chapter, they talk about how um, Heather was chatting with one of her friends who runs the organization 350. And she asked her friend like, so, you know, do you think there's like racism in this environmental advocacy movement? And her friend said, I've, I've actually never thought about it. Um, and how could there be? Because we talk about different cultures, like how do we talk to someone in Hong Kong versus how do we talk to someone in Egypt versus how do we talk to someone in Mississippi? Um, and then her friend actually, who runs a, a very, you know, well-known influential organization, um, came back, I think it was a few years later and said, whoa, like we missed this. And so, so I, I do think like, when I think about like the communities I work in, um, we don't see a presence of like those big organizations. Like we see tons of amazing, I mean, there is a network of amazing small community-based organizations um, that are fighting climate change on local levels. And and coalition, you know, forming coalitions and working together. But like, 
comparative, comparatively to the big greens, they're under-resourced um, and they're, you know, you're always struggling to get by. You're like, um, <laughs> you're like grasping to get that next dollar so you can paint that next rooftop or you can plant that next tree or you can buy that next e-bike. And so I do think that there is the people that can feel the impact of climate change the most are not seeing the resources that Big Green's raised and also not being mobilized in more global action um, from it. And I think that could be, I mean, it struck me. I had never really thought about it in that way before until reading the book. And um, it is, it is a overlooked until now resource. Yeah, I think that's, it's in the nonprofit world too, with those large nonprofits, there's, they've always been dominated by a very white male uh, Yes, you know, organizational structure. And so I think that you can see that when she talks about that, those missed opportunities, if there were more people of color in those executive management functions, they would know how to communicate with the communities they want to help. How about you, Paul? Yeah. Um, I see missed opportunities a lot, but I always <laughs> end the loop in a level of positivity. Um, one of my favorite pictures, by the way, is of Kobe Bryant. Um, the great, great Kobe Bryant, when he won the 2001 championship, he was, what, 21 years old, two-time NBA champion, and then he's holding the trophy, and he's in the shower, he's upset, because he didn't get the finals MVP. And, you know, he, you know you're like, dude, you got your second champion, you just be happy, you know? <laughs> you're 21 years old, but he's like, ah, you know, what can I do for the next level? And, for example, like, let's go back to Yonkers. We did the community energy rollout, and we did a community information session in Spanish with then-majority leader Corazon Peter Isaac, and I'm, I should have known... Corson is of Dominican heritage and there's a Dominican culture association at Yonkers. So being able to get them to co-sponsor, that's a missed opportunity. Or when I find out that people aren't plugged into the program, sustainable watches it has for free, like grid rewards, you can have real-time tracking of your electricity use as easy as you track your the weather or check your highlights or ESPN. Um, and when I found out people don't have that, that's a missed opportunity. When people don't have um, the recycle right application, when you have your, your municipalities garbage and recycling collection schedule in your application, um, that's a missed opportunity. Uh, you know, it's really, uh, when it comes to the missed opportunities, it's really um, seeing what is causing these negative feedback loops in a way. What are the obstacles? What are the issues that people are experiencing? Why aren't they being aware of this programming, if this is designed to impact them the most, you know, the people that need the programming the most should have access to it. But there is a systematic disconnect that's historically perpetuated our communities, which is uh, which is why we're dealing with the situation that we are now. Which is why we're dealing with the situation. The city of Mount Vernon has a sewage infrastructure that's collapsed, you know, and and our inability to come together as a county community to be able to be preemptive with predicting and remediating these issues before um, they become set new segments on CBS News and things like that. Because, um, you know, these cities are in counties that we share together. And if we don't do what we need to do, it's going to impact us. If the sewage treatment plant in Southwest Yonkers implodes because of our inability or missed opportunities for sustainable retrofits to take access to rebates and ICERTA, um, What's going to happen with 70 percent of the sewage you know uh, washington county is being treated there what's going to happen when we're flushing toilets in rye or Meredith or 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 in new rochelle you know it's gonna it's gonna you know probably bounce back and we're going to be like people in mount vernon unfortunately so you know when it comes to missed opportunity we have to really look at what is a systematic framework and it's really um it's apathy as I said before, some people literally say, like me in the environmental field, I'm a privileged battle, you know? I remember one time I went to the Mount Vernon Boys and Girls Club, met with Mel Campos. It was during my time as an intern for the Federated Conservationist with Aunt Jackie Holmes. I don't know if any of you know her, phenomenal woman. And Mel Campos is like, Paul, community gardens are great, but I'm dealing with kids that they come to me for the highest meal nutritional value every day. Come to me, community gardens. I'm gonna tell you, get out. Because <laughs> I'm dealing with real issues. We're talking about jobs. We're talking about career pathway, which is why the work that you're doing is very important in terms of workforce development transparency. Because with this renewable energy transition is a job, an immersion of an economy. And there are programs, you can become HVAC technicians. Air we have one like that. <laughs> you can literally give people that level of, of, of environmental entrepreneurship at a very young age, where not only can they go to school like Washington Community College and get their sources of science, but they have a part-time job being an HVAC technician installer or a heat pump installer and make 
some pretty good coin. You know, when I was in college, I was a, I was a, I was a seafood clerk at Shoprite. You know, imagine, <laughs> and I'm in environmental science. I'm going into. I, I imagine if I would have, you know, been able to have a part time job, you know, installing heat pumps, that would have probably, uh, you know, put, put me in a, in a good place, uh, you know, at, at a very young age. And um, that infrastructure is out there, but. Um, you know, it's really about us really capitalizing that. If we see a missed opportunity, we take the notes so that when next year, it doesn't happen again because these, these things, everything happens in cycles. You know, you have um, opportunities that are opening the New York State for grant funded opportunities. It's all about us coming together and make private public partnerships. Maybe some of you might have the freedom and time to be able to help the village of Portchester write a grant application. Some of you might be grant writers. Some of you might have environmental backgrounds. Some of you might have engineering engineers in your family, if you're not engineers yourself, that can help with doing assessment studies and things of that nature. So missed opportunities, um, it's, it's, it's only a mistake if it happens once because we're aware of the problem. If the problem occurs and you're aware of it, then you're just complicit with it. Well, that kind of gets us into the next question, which is, and I want to kind of leave on a positive note, um, which Heather McGee talks about for the zero sum game, that if we all work together, there's a solidarity dividend. And so um, I'm sure both of you, I'm hoping both of you have come across these uh, payoffs um, where the solidarity dividend works for everyone. Um, I'm going to let you start, Paul, uh, seeing if you've had a situation where um, you can actually visualize or help the audience visualize how this works. Wow, we're all connected. <laughs> oh, that's what I would say. Uh, what unifies us, um, where we live, our proximity to each other, what we need to sustain ourselves, our air, our water. And that really should be, I guess, the foundation that unites us and keeps us in solidarity with one another. Um, when I saw the flyer, amazing coalition organizations that, are, that are sponsored and they're helping the track program. But I also did say, hey, where's African American, American men in Westchester? You know, where's the Coastal Cultural Association, Cultural Association of Yonkers? Um, you know, you know, where, where's the where's the copy of the flyer in Spanish? Westchester County is twenty six point eight percent Hispanic. You know, you know, I, is the Zoom also have language 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 translation services? Is that there? Is that a click go button at the bottom? You know, you know, these are the podemos hacer otro en español. Eso se quiere, podemos hacer eso, but it's really important um, that we have that as a basic infrastructure of solidarity of knowing how do we get this information out there and how do we do it to get it out to as many people as we can because we're not we're not only pushing it out ourselves but we're, we're connecting with the people that have direct access to the traffic flow of people that we're trying to reach out to you have one of the i'll be honest you know your top colombian leader westchester county i think i'm number three but you're the top you know <laughs> <laughs> the top, you know? It's by you, I don't know, Daniel Bonet. I don't know if you know him, you know, you see, that's number two, you know, yeah, so it is. And I'm, you know, I'm there probably number three, you know, <laughs> but, um, you know, so you could, that's the one that could help you with that linguistic equity of the engagement and transparency of services. So, um, you know, solidarity, the solidarity movement can come, but we really need to bring together the framework of who needs the services. Who has a direct traffic flow? It might be a meeting with a Yonkers uh, uh, um, CEO of the YMCA. It might happen to meet with um, members of the, uh, the NAACP. You know, we have chapters all throughout Westchester County. Um, that is how you're able to connect with them and tell them that you're planning this idea. Don't go there with a flyer. Go to them when you're planning the thought leadership of the program so they can have a seat at the table. You know, they might have been like, hey, Paul's a great speaker, but I know somebody else is way better. And I'm like, okay, no problem, my brother. I'll be taking a back seat <laughs> and it'll be great. But um, these, these, this is the way that we can do it. And the, the, the thing about the Westchester is so great is that we have this infrastructure that's already there. There are community-based organizations that do not exist in Orange County, in Putnam County up in Allegheny County, you know? <laughs> oh, you know, the, the, we, there's a little bit of um, privilege that we have here that we really have to make it, that we have to really take, capitalize and do it because if Washington County can do it, New York State can do it, and everyone's watching New York State because, you know, even Biden copied our, our climate agenda for his presidential <laughs> administration. Jen, that question goes to you too about the solidarity dividend. I know you've had some great successes yeah, I related to educating, sorry, to training individuals too. Yeah, I, I know it's funny because Paul and I come from two very different perspectives, like the government perspective where it's like messy and complicated and, um, and super hard. Um, I have chosen to stick in the community-based nonprofit um, space for my career thus far um, because I like to be kind of like right 
Like, I like the tangibility of like seeing programs in action all the time. And so, um, and what I loved about the sum of us is that as much as Heather, you know, used the data and used the economics and, and made us all recognize like the false narrative of the zero sum game, like she, she ends almost every chapter on the high note of like, if people work together, this is what it can look like. And I kept wanting, like, as I was reading the same sky chapter and she was talking about, um, the experience in Richmond of folks coming together, um, to fight the, the plant that was polluting both the, you know, lower income neighborhood and the higher income neighborhood. Um, it, I was like, come here, come look at all these programs that are working in New York. Um, and so a couple that I would love to highlight, I alluded to it already. One of the programs uh, that the HOPE program has run for the past, I guess, decade at this point, um, we do it in partnership with New York City Small Business Services. Um, and it was originally, in part, it's, it's really actually interesting. It was originally in partnership with New York City Department of Buildings because it was just about making rooftops white. And it was like, let us give an organization the paint, find the it's special white coating paint, find the volunteers and, um, and paint the buildings white and mitigate the urban heat island effect. And then uh, probably about six, five or six years ago, they said, huh, this is an environmental program, but it's also a workforce development program. And so they moved it out of Department of Buildings, put it in New York City's Small Business Services Department, which oversees the city's workforce development programming. And they said, rather than finding volunteers to do this, um, let's find unemployed New Yorkers who want to build a skill set and get a job and have them do this. And so for the past five years, um, every single year, we have 70 unemployed New Yorkers that get training um, and they get their OSHA 30. They get, which is um, for those folks who don't know, it's like um, the basic certification you need to get almost any job in uh, construction, in energy efficiency, um, in any sort of safety work. So they all get their OSHA 30. They all get their scaffolding um, certification. They all get their flagger certification. They all get their first aid certification because you're on rooftops and, you know, there could be dangerous situations where you need emergency help immediately. They also all get wraparound services of digital literacy, of financial empowerment, of mental health and work wellness services. So they get all these wraparound services at the same time, 30 hours a week, they are painting rooftops white, making New York City greener or more energy efficient and earning money that goes back that they can use for their families. And they do this for 10 weeks, get all these trainings, do all this work to make New York City greener. And then we are very privileged um, that we have lots of employer partners who then hire them. So they've gotten training for 10 weeks while getting paid, while impacting the environment positively. And then they go out and they get full-time permanent employment um, because it's not just about getting that job. It's about building a career and the future economy is green. The future of good jobs are green. And so like, if we can invest in communities that, that need this investment and are that directly impacted by, by these environmental, this climate crisis um, and turn it into but, you know, money and jobs and careers, it's a win, win, win. Another project we're involved in that really um, resonated with me and I made me think of it when, when Heather talks about the solidarity dividend. I don't wonder if Heather's listening in minds that I just refer to her like she's my best friend. <laughs> um, I feel like I know you, Heather. Um, if, if anyone who hasn't read it, you can like go down through a whole rabbit hole. There's a million podcasts and YouTube videos oh, yeah. and she's amazing. But um Another project we work on is called the Equitable Commute Project. And you mentioned earlier that you're somehow involved in the uh, UN Sustainable Development um, Goals. Well, we work with um, NYU's Sustainable Development folks, and we work with a consulting firm called Electric Avenue, and we work with um, a few more folks. And our goal is to get 5,000 e-bikes and e-scooters into the hands of essential workers in New York City. Um, you know, 
folks in Westchester often have cars or other ways to get to their jobs. In New York, people use subways and buses. And particularly in the Bronx, uh, the subways run north and south, the buses run east and west, and someone could literally live 15 minutes away by car and it could take them two hours to get to work. And so our goal, and this became crystal clear, you know, during the past two years of the pandemic, that people have really struggles with, with their commute. And so the goal is to get 5,000 e-bikes and e-scooters into the hands. It's better for the environment than paying for Ubers. It saves money and taxis and all that. It saves money. Um, it's it, So it's it's environmental win. It's a, it's a money win. Um, and then it's also an acknowledgement um, that like even when there's a crisis and many people have the privilege of being able to work from home, there's essential workers out there that need to get to and from work despite you know, in order to get money, in order to do their jobs, despite subway shutdowns or bus shutdowns and everything like that. And then where hope comes into this is, in addition to connecting this coalition with tons of essential workers, um, we're developing a bike mechanic program. Um, and e-bikes and e-scooters um, require handling of lithium batteries. Um, and lithium batteries are are going to be the future of many, many um, jobs. And so that skill set will teach someone to be a bike mechanic, but also like start building a career in other areas of lithium battery. Um, and there's lots more examples. I could go on and on. Um, Paul mentioned it before, HVAC and heating pumps um, in partnership with New York State government, NYSERDA, um, we're running a program training people to be high efficiency HVAC technicians. Um, again, these are unemployed folks who are coming through our program, getting the certifications they need and all the wraparound services, um, and then going out and literally like making, making New York more energy efficient. I see what you all did. You know, you, you put me on a panel with a white woman that does more to get black people jobs than I do. So, I, don't know. I see what you did. Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's good, you know. Yeah, I like this. Um, so that actually ends uh, my questions. Um, this has been amazing. You guys are both extremely enlightening, and I've learned a ton. I mean, I'm hoping actually the two of you will actually connect more and more on. I thought when you're in prep, I thought Paul was really quiet. And now I'm like, oh my God, he has so much to say. <laughs> I've learned a ton today too. Um, but we uh, are going to open up for questions and answer to the audience. If anyone here um, here has a question. Oh, okay. Um, so savvy. If <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. Um, if anyone has a question out there uh, to Paul or to Jen, or, or here first. So thank you so much for being here. It's amazing. I just really appreciate your time. Awesome. But I'm a mom of two little kids. I live in Larchmont. Um, I grew up in Rye. I would love to know some really practical ways that I can use my time to sense any advice or any first steps for someone like me who can really get involved, organizations, whatever it is to take to kind of you know, make progress. Do you want to take it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can go first. Um, um, so um, one of the things I would mention is um, you have two um, young, you have two future leaders of America in your home. So I guess do what you can to empower them, you know, teach them about recycling, tell them how they could go to their school and create a recycling program, how they could create an environmental earth club or a green club, you know, and, um, you know, um, or how they could be able to um, help engage the extracurricular lens um, of opportunities that are available out there. Um, I, I strongly encourage youth engagement because we messed up. Our generation, even me, I'm, 
playing video games while, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, we're, we're talking about um, climate change, things like that. You know, I should have been in the game, you know, I'm coming home from Boy Scouts America trips with John and I'm going straight to the TV, you know, I should have continued to, to do it more, but um, definitely towards like, you know, youth engagement opportunities, um, just leveraging and partnering with your children to have that intergenerational dialogue. And then you can also go above and beyond by looking and seeing what are some issues that are happening, using your professional background. You might be strong in digital organizing, you might be strong in computers, you might be ha having some sort of um, in a medical background where you can help with environmental health analysis. I don't know your strengths, I don't know your superpower, but there's ways that you can still channel it to help out uh, members of the community, if not in Rye, but other areas. I, I do know Rye does have relations um, through the town as well as through some municipalities within the town. So probably looking at some census data information and seeing who's there and seeing um, or if they're being fairly represented within local municipality meetings. And if not, jumping on those meetings and saying, hey, um, we need to talk to more people and things like that. Because um, if you have the time to be able to step up for other people that don't have that time, um, then you'll do it. You know, I, I consider myself to be in, in the minority of someone that um, will work long hours and then be in extracurriculars that probably um, help me get back on the hamster wheel at work at a, at a high level of efficiency. And, you know, or, or someone that works long hours, but I'm probably after work, I'm reading a, a, a 60 page PDF document of a bill in the state legislature, things like that, you know? Like these are things that, you know, people should be aware of, but if not, it's the people that are able to become aware of these resources that can then liaise the pre key information. But I would say, I don't know what your superpower is, but channel it, but you have a young queen, a young king, or a young, I don't know, <laughs> you, know you know, all of them, you know, they're the future and any way that you can empower them to become a stronger version of themselves, I think it'll be great. Paul, just a quick piggyback on that. I know that you're doing a talk on Monday on the municipality, Municipal Sustainability Commissions and Climate Smart Task Force. Oh, that, wow. <laughs> I got an email. Yes. <laughs> I want sustainability collaboratives and stuff. So I didn't know if that's something that people can can jump in on to listen in. Join your sustainability committee. You know, if you have the time, I should have been said that. Join the Climate <laughs> Smart Community Program. This is the organizing that could help leverage the um, the um, civil society within all of our communities to help expedite grant opportunities or organizational programming. This, you know, certain municipalities, it's very expensive to hire a sustainability coordinator, you know? Uh, that is a position that is probably a full-time, if not an executive level position within city hall or village hall or town hall. These are these are director level positions that cost a little bit of point because you're dealing not only with the global energy transition, but you're also dealing with soil, water conservation, uh, and air assessments. It's a lot of things. So any way that you can get involved and support the, the climate smart communities program within the city of within the city of Rye, or how you could be um, able to help with programming. Um, yes, if you want to join, please email me anybody, Paul at stateofwashington.org. I'll get you that information. I'll also say that on the 28th of February, um, there is going to be a county intermunicipal summit, Eco Summit, that's being sponsored by the county government, Peter McCart, our county's director of sustainability and energy conservation, as well as the New York State Association of Conservation Commission. That's an organization that was created in 1971 by the DEC to encourage municipalities to create and municipal environmental advisory committees all throughout the state of New York because you need to have that citizen's power within the renewable energy um, policy creation that occurs in all of our municipal governments. Um, so yes, Climate Smart Communities is the nice sort of program for municipalities to be able to um, be part of the renewable energy transition. We passed the resolution 2019, Climate Leadership and Protection Act. Our grid has to be at 70% renewable by 2030 and 100% renewable by 2040 uh, in terms of our carbon free emission. We, we, and if we don't meet that, it's pretty much, uh, I, I'm not going to say things are going to get apocalyptic, but it's things are going to um, not get better. That's all I can say. And that climate smart communities program it really provides a framework for you to be able to have that um have that transition through support that state with the, the complete economic literacy and decisions that need to be made thank you can i add a couple more things Absolutely. i i ditto everything paul said i think that it starts at home like planting trees and teaching kids to recycle and all that i then think you know, getting involved in systems and advocacy efforts and all that, super important. You have leaders, as Paul's already pointed out in the room, like you could volunteer at Community Resource Center. You could get involved with CURE if you're not involved with CURE um, already. It looks like you are. Nicole just smiled at you. Um, 
Yeah, we we at Hope have volunteers all the time. Um, if you want to come into the city, we also have virtual volunteer opportunities and other ways to support. And so I think all of those are like kind of very tangible things you can do. Um, but when when I reflect on on the sum of us and Heather McGee's book, uh, like I think that like it's also stepping back a bit and like this is all about the solidarity dividend and that like if we are all stronger together and you don't realize that and you don't feel that unless you put yourself in situations where you make relationships and build relationships with folks who aren't, who are easy to build relationships with or people who aren't like in your neighborhood or whose kids don't go to the same school as your kids go to. And so like, what I think it starts with, like in order, in order for everyone to realize the solidarity dividend is like, get, I mean, and there's a tagline for cure, right? What is it like? Let's talk. It's uncomfortable. What? Yeah. What's it? Racism. Yeah, race and racism is uncomfortable. Let's talk about it. Sometimes. Yeah. Race and racism is uncomfortable. Let's talk about it. <laughs> but like, put yourself in uncomfortable situations. Like, um, you know, Paul's mentioned it a couple of times about like, so much of this is about, um, diversity and equity and inclusion um, and conversations about diversity, equity and inclusion are messy and they're complicated and people make mistakes. And the only way you kind of learn the tools on how to talk about it is if you do it, put yourself out there and make those mistakes and say something and have someone call you out on it and then learn from that and move forward. And so I, I think it's like, just get uncomfortable. Like, like it's, it's, it's how we're all going to grow. Um, one of the things, um, in the same sky chapter that Heather McGee talked about is how, um, it was the researcher from Sweden who, um, they were having this whole conversation about like social dominance theory. Um, and then there was a fire alarm in the building and they went outside and then, um, Heather said, this is when it got, she, uh, the woman from Sweden said, oh, you know, I, I first realized how different I was when I got to New York, because like everybody doesn't look the same as me in my country, everybody looks the same with me. And Heather just had this little line where she said, and her voice said it falteringly, because she started talking about her personal, like, race and her personal situation. And like, we are not given the tools. We're not, we are given lots of tools like as we grow up, but we're not given the tools in our society to comfortably talk about that. And so we have to start practicing that in order to move forward on any of these things and realize that we really all are in it together. When you talk about that Swedish woman, the, um, the line that I always think of from that book, which went in her book was she said, if the society doesn't even care if the individual doesn't have shelter, how are they going to care if they drown? And I was just like, oh, that's awful and yet so powerful. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I'm correct. They can't hear your question. So can you just repeat the question? Oh, yeah, repeat what she, what he, what he yeah. is. Okay. So I want to ground this a little bit. So I live in Rye, and what people worry about in this town are loud leaf blowers. And we fight about whether or not we should get rid of the leaflets. And I look at Geronimo, my peer over here, who I adore, and I think about the landscape folks that work in our community every day. And I wonder if you could take Heather McGee's book and have a little bit of a conversation with us. It was about workforce development. It's about energy. We need to get EV-powered vehicles. Leaders in Rye need to step up We've got the money and tax papers have the money. We need to put the money in to buy the EV materials, start with the municipalities, set the example for the homeowners. And so when they put those permits on those landscapers and they all have to pay for it and they have to worry about fire departments and they lost all their trucks in the floods because they were in the Maranac and they had to like deal with the landscaping our beautiful lawns. Why are we not having that conversation? That's the conversation we need to be having because it's a workforce development conversation and it's an environmental sustainability conversation. And we need to be comfortable having both conversations together. You have amazing examples. What should we do for landscaping? So before, I'm just going to say the question, <laughs> not as passionately as uh, she did. I, I, I literally was thinking to myself, 
Oh, I'm so glad I don't have your job to like repeat that whole question back. <laughs> it's about um, the leaf blower ban um, that I understand that's happened in Rye and how um, it's impacting those who, who are our gardeners who come in and who maintain our lawns. And, um, and they are being told that they can't, um, they're no longer allowed to use their gas powered leaf blowers. Um, and there's an opportunity here where we can work on environmental issues, but also deal with the environmental justice side of it and making sure we're addressing the environmental racism where it's disproportionately impacting people of color. Did I do that justice? I think you did. Okay. <laughs> She said something in part. She said, We have the money. And we have the money. Wait, wait. wait. <laughs> Rye has the money. And this is an example in our municipalities, in our town parks, in our public areas to go to towards these things. And yet there's always going to be resistance because it's like, Why well, should I pay for something? And, you know. So I just think it's important that we have that conversation. So you two are brilliant. I just want to say brilliant. <laughs> I can barely follow you, Paul. You know, so much policy walking talk. I'm like, oh my God, this guy's brilliant. But like, give us some room and grounding. What would I do as a citizen if I were walking into my city council? So I don't want, I think you should start because I don't want to say anything uh, that's undermining what Sustainable Westchester is already doing on this because I don't know enough about it. <laughs> but I, I, yeah. I would first say I got to get your email. Um, I feel your passion too. And um, I could definitely connect you to our program manager for uh, sustainable landscaping, Neha Dantrick. And um, she could help you with some talking points and knowing about the um, economic justice that occurs with that transition. Because, you know, as I said, a lot of people don't have the time to watch Village Board. Oh, wow, you're awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, a lot of people don't have the um, the um, the bandwidth to be able to look at a city city council meeting, um, you know, late into the evening and things like that, or 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 know what's happening um, in the municipality whatsoever. They're just going to be blindsided by the transition and these permits and these regulations going to be put onto them. But there is ways that we could help with the um, the transparency, the transition, um, the assistance with access to the electrified equipment and things like that. We are our sustainable landscaping program is creating um, agma green um, green zones, zone green zones that are being designated by the American Green Zone Alliance. And we do make sure that we do a certain level of of um, of, of of work with letting the people that are in the the, the field right now know what resources they can access to be part of the transition to be with the wave uh, or ahead of the curve because they're prepared to see what's happening so Nia can, can help you with that um the one thing i would say is that um i don't know what happens from there <laughs> i don't know what's going to happen when you connect with neha and you have to go through the city council of rye you know <laughs> i i don't know how, how what's what's, what's going to happen on that point but i do know that we Neha can give you the, the talking points, the resources, and the um, economic feasibility assessments for the transition, um, because this trend that has to happen. You know, the the, the, the data is out there in terms of the uh, the impact that on site combustion, um, combustion is having on people of color that are doing that on um, that labor in terms of air quality, compromise of respiratory and immune systems, so that when they get COVID, they're probably seeing the severities of the symptoms. Um, so this transition, it kind of has to happen, but it's really letting people know about what's available and how they could do it and do the transition to a level of, of economic prosperity because they're seeing the return on investment of, you know, the sacrifice they're making for, you know, you know, it might, you know, to, to, you know, you know, if you, I don't know, how was last time any of you ever went to a hospital? The bill is crazy, you know? <laughs> The bill is crazy. My, my grandpa just had a pacemaker that was put into him. And uh, my dad got the bill for the ambulance he had to call. I'm like, damn, dad, I could have drove myself. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's, it's, it's really, it's a lot. You know, if we don't do um, the, make the economic decisions now that we need to make, it's going to become way more costly, not only on society level or municipality level, but on our own, um, our, our own personal finances as we're, as we're trying to um, um, play safe maintenance with our, with our health. Yeah. Um, so this is what I would add to it. And what it makes me think about is there are um, through the federal bills that have been passed um, and in New York State itself, millions, if not billions of dollars being put into electrification. Um, 
I mean, there's so much money being put into electrification right now. And there's, a, and I, I, I can look it up and send it to you, but there's a program right now being run by New York City Department of Transportation. Um, I think it's called the Clean Trucks Program or the Green Trucks Program, but whatever it is, it's basically um, encouraging um, corporations, and I know about the ones in Hunts Point, I don't know, I think it's citywide though, to switch from their diesel trucks, which are causing the asthma and causing the pollution to um, the electric trucks. And what this program does is it's Department of Transportation that's saying this will cost for every truck, I think it is, an additional $40,000 investment for the first year. And so we, DOT, will cover that $40,000 additional investment to encourage the electrification of entire fleets. And so there is like, now is like, I always say, like I work at the cusp of workforce development and the green economy and the climate crisis. And like, we're living in a moment right now, right? There is resources at federal levels, at state levels. Um, and I don't, I'm, I forgive me because I don't know about like Westchester municipalities, but like New York city, like there's, there's literally three levels of government, like dumping money into environmental solutions um, right now. And so this to me seems like so such a right for like subsidize um, the landscapers to make the transition from their things to electric leaf blowers and electric trucks and all that. Um, and in the long term, it's a win, win, win for everybody. So is it the small business, the small business? I mean, yeah, I don't know. I, I seems like you. <laughs> <laughs> there are. We've named you the big player on this. <laughs> and there are allies like you could connect with the the um the Rye Portchester branch and NLACP. There are can we all just need a little bit of time to do some research, but there are some people that you could bring into the fold um to build up that support base. And there's George Randy you can yeah. tell us who. <laughs> there's a lot of lawn companies right now who are actually marketing as green companies that do electric, and so there's some there's a financial incentive that companies are using. They're you know they're increasing their prices, but they're using that to stay, you know, come to us, we stay green. I think this is me outside the importance of place like Brian is the other number of conversations because it's an environmental justice conversation as much as it is a conversation. Yep. So that's why I said it, because I feel like we miss these moments, right? To have a conversation that's more than a zero sum game that's all about. Yeah, particularly because a lot of times it's not their neighbors. They don't have a relationship with them. So there's a disconnect about who they're impacting. Um, we're kind of, we're counting on why, right. Westchester County counts on right to be <laughs> part of that, that the forefront, the vanguard of sustainability and the free flowing marketplace of ideas. We really are counting on right. Pressure. I know. I was gonna say <laughs> um, do we have any other questions from um, our audience that's virtual? I think we do. She looks like yeah, okay. she was nodding vehemently as she's figuring it out. Oh, I have a, I have a question. You do? Yeah, I do oh, have a question. Okay. I, I, I have a question. I was like, if I can, because I'm really excited um, since both of you talk about this a lot, if you could talk about how you see the, um, the Green New Deal um, the Green New Deal that hasn't passed, but I know that a lot of the states are implementing their own versions of it and what your thoughts are for if you've seen the New York one or the versions of New York one. She mentions it just a tad bit in the book, but I know that both of you are more involved and so you might be able to educate our audience into what that might even entail. Since I know it's all over the news, but maybe a lot of people don't even know what that means. He's the policy guy. Yeah. <laughs> I think Brianna Gunright is brilliant, uh, the author of the Green, the Green New Deal. Deal that hasn't happened, happened, I know that a lot of the states are implementing their own versions of it and what your thoughts are for if you. Yeah. Wait, so, I think that we, we can. Uh, that was you, I think. Yeah, uh, so I'll, I'll take the first swing. Um, I actually uh, recently became the um, National Communications Director for the Democratic National Committee's Climate Council. And, you know, putting a climate agenda, this is what we do because 
you know, I, I do delineate, you know, I am colorblind when, when I'm on the plot for state of Westchester, I don't look at the color of someone's tie, you know, I was told, you know, ask someone what political party you're affiliated with when you're in a community garden. I used to be a Republican, by the way, you know, mm -hmm. let everybody know that, you know, I used to be a Republican, you know, I was raised in a conservative household. I used to, you know, go to school, I mean, not go to school, go to church wearing suits, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I didn't speak back to my aunts or my, you know, my uncles and things like that. And, um, but it reaches a point where you know that, um, um, it's easier to help good people achieve greatness than tell bad people to stop doing bad things. You know, that's really the path I chose that I want to do on it. That was a transition that I made. And um, when it comes to the Green New Deal, um, it's something that should be done. Um, you know, sometimes when you're doing innovative ideas, it's not popular by the people that have been um, socially conditioned to accept things as they are. Um, you know, when we think about heliocentrism, Copernicus, you know, these are these are people that were burned at the stake for saying that the sun is not that saying that the earth is not the center of the universe. Well, Martin Luther King, you know, we just had a Martin Luther King Day. Um, and so many people are putting fantastic things that he was talking about now. Martin Luther King was not popular when he passed away. Yeah. It was a it was a um, I think it was a poll that was it was a kept poll that showed that he had a 75% disapp disapproval rating. That's more unpopular than President Trump in his last year in office, you know? So uh, these are things that, you know, have to be understood. Um, we're gonna have to have some very uncomfortable decisions, very, very uncomfortable decisions. And unless we start having them, we're not gonna be able to um, really have that forward thinking ideas. And when it comes to Green New Deal, it's something that it has to be done, you know? Uh, John Warrior, you're the, you're the policy one. How popular was FDR's Green New Deal? What would they call FDR? Socialist, communist? What, 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 they, what do they call FDR back? They basically call him the administration anything but their given names. Exactly. There were some nasty things being told about a man that was struggling with polio to be president of the United States. Um, so, you know, this this has to occur, Green New Deal. There have been, there can be some tweaks that be done, but there has to be a transition. There ha We have to transition um, from to the renewable economy, prioritize the communities that have been historically disenfranchised through, um, through legislation to America. So this, so this legislation could be um, local um, zoning laws or planning board policies, and some of the discrimination could go back into historical redlining, which is why certain school districts can't afford to maintain their sewage districts in, no, right now because of policies that were passed before uh, my father qualified for a student visa to come here from Haiti in 1778. Um, so right now, I think, Please contact your congressman. Please contact your senator because it's really important Congress that person. congressperson, congressperson, <laughs> your senator. Um, it's really important that people understand the civic literacy and power that you have to help influence policy. You can make a call to um, congressman for New York 16. Not is New York 17 we're in right now or New York 16. You can make a comp. You can make a. Yeah, we could we could you could get in contact with Congressman. We could get we could all get in contact with Congressman Bowman. Um, I'm pretty. He's also the chair of the um he's a member of the squad. If anyone knows, um, he's very close with AOC. He was at the forefront of the fight for the Green New Deal, and he's also the chair of the Energy Committee for the House Subcommittee on Science and Technology. So we have resources that are available to help really be proactive with advocating for that. But the Green New Deal has to happen, and you know if there's any issues with the minutia of the feasibility, just take a moment to analyze who are the people that are trying to resolve it through a forward thinking um, level of analysis and who are the people that are just um, picking and choosing um, issues that are that, that could disregard the idea. It's the, the Green New Deal is an idea, it's a concept that we need to do something with a level of urgency, otherwise we're gonna continue to see this economic implosion among different economies that are related to climate change, fishery industries, um, you know, renewable energy transition, indoor air quality. Um, there is a legitimate level of environmental racism happening in America, you know, and that's why the Green New Deal is bringing attention to, but there are people that are uncomfortable becoming aware of what's happening outside of the bubble of their own personal paradigm of the American dream. So it's going to happen, and we do have the resources. Congressman Mondaire Jones, please contact him, and um, he definitely could um, He's um, a help. Spring Valley High School graduate, just like me, Mondaire Jones. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Congressman Mondaire Jones, or Jamal Bowman, New York 16 we're in right now. Sorry. Uh, is, I, well, Everyone's in different ones here. Yeah. Yes. And we have audience members from all over. So, so Mondaire Jones is the rep, uh, the freshman class rep on the House Majority Leadership for the current mm -hmm. Congress. So he's literally in the meeting. He's on the steering committee for the state for Congress with Speaker Pelosi. And 
Um, Congressman Bowman is also the chair of the Energy Committee for the House Subcommittee of Science and Technology. He's also vice chair of the Environment and um, Environment and Labor Committee. Um, so, you know, we have some power players here. So we definitely can be at the forefront. I say we're counting on a ride. We're counting on a ride. <laughs> okay. So um, I have a question, unless you want to answer, John. No, no, no. I. Um, okay, I have a question for both of you because this is really, I think this is great. Um, do you visit schools or would you be interested in talking to high schoolers about what you do? And I think that's, that would be amazing. Yeah. Um, so before I, I was at Sustainable Westchester, I was an intern for the Federated Conservationist of Westchester County, the first environmental education nonprofit created in the state of New York, 1965. This is a nonprofit that's older than the, than the EPA, Observances of Earth Day in America, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act. You know, this is a historical, historical, um, 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 you know, value that this organization has. That's here in Westchester. Um, their office is at Pace Law School, if any of you want to um, look into that. And we created, when I was an intern there, um, I, uh, I came intern in 2018, um, a student network so that students, high school students and college students um, all throughout Westchester County could be able to unite together and do youth programming. Um, because if you get students together across the various school districts in Westchester County, it's that's the way you could gain the leverage to set up a meeting with uh, a county legislator now Nancy Barr, who's the vice chair of the county board of legislators, or county legislator Damien Barr, or you know uh, members of the county board of legislators, members of the state senate, members of the state assembly, because um, it's important that young people have that exposure to being in meetings with policymakers and not being spoken down to and not being cheated like children. It's a very, very professional experience for people. So what we're doing with the Federated Conservationists is really providing that opportunity for youth engagement, because if we have people um, in Sweden, like Gardner Thunberg, um, that are protesting um, non-representation in, in, in government or in, act, in um, inactivity or, or less a sense of complacency with, with, the, with the climate policy um, that, that, that's, um, that's, that's um, comparable to the, the, the expedited degradation we see in our communities, um, we need to take advantage of that in Westchester County because we have the privilege of having people in government that are looking for young people. You know, people are protesting, cutting class on Fridays um, to be able to um, be taken serious by government leaders. But here in Westchester, we have government leaders that are looking for young people. We're, they want to meet with Sunrise. They want to meet with um, high school students within the district. Um, State Senator Shelley Mayer, she's the senator for the district. I think she's, she has right, right? She has a youth <laughs> advisory board. You know, I was making sure. She has a youth advisory board. If any of you know Perla Arellano, amazing, phenomenal community leader that helps create that so they can get high school students um, and school districts all throughout the district to be able to tell the chair of the state senate education committee what should be happening and what young people think. And that's phenomenal. Um, so that that could be created. But in terms of our, our, our program with FCWC, we strongly encourage it is engaging school districts to not only unite them across their um, across their school buildings for climate dialogues or disseminating career opportunities. Um, you could also connect with them to um, let them know about ideas and programming. We're in Black History Month. You could have an environmental club go to a local African-American or Black Student Union and do a tree planting. Hispanic Heritage Month um, do a tree planting um, with a local Latino student association, Hispanic um, student association. And there is no excuse. Semester Rye has a lot of money. Rye is also in the Tree City USA Network for the Arbor Day Foundation, where you could buy a white fir tree through the, the tree store for like $6.99, the cost of a breakfast sandwich. I could get a white, I could get a white fir tree that will last 300 years for six hundred six dollars and ninety-nine cents. You know, that's phenomenal. So there's there's really countless opportunities, but it's really about creating that youth dialogue, but also when you talk to young people, you're having that um, that first conversation, I think it's called el primer paso, you know, you gotta listen a lot and figure out what it is that they care about, what they're passionate about. If you have a, if you have people that wanna, you know, put LED light bulbs in school districts, don't force them to do community gardening, you know? <laughs> you know, just really figure out what they're passionate about and show that they can pursue it and it'll be in alignment with their professional aspirations. So no matter what you wanna do, what a career aspiration you have, you need good water, you need clean air, and you need to care about the environment that you're working in. But I can't tell them that you will go to their high school, yeah. yes? FCWC, FCWC, yes. FCWC will be going get, to high get you the student network. We have a ton of internship opportunities at a state of Washington as well too. Um, we'll be happy to connect people because that it's really the transparency 
of um, what's available. And especially if you're trying to um, um, diversify the career field, because you want to make sure that this is getting to the people that are in the communities that are going to be doing sustainable development. It'll be great to have people in Mount Vernon help us with the development of Mount Vernon that are in Peekskill helping the development of Peekskill. That's really how we can do it, but it really focused with getting information to people before they're siloed through the adulthood and you know, you know, you know, they reach the point where people are talking to you about climate change, you hear the adult noise from the Charlie Brown cartoons. But when you're young, you can get that information because they care, you know, they know uh, what's important and they're not socially conditioned through what, how adulthood beats you up of just making excuses why you can't do something now. And, and same with you, Jenna, I, I'm assuming you're going to say yes, you will. <laughs> so I, I have two boys that go to Mamaroneck High School. I have spoken at Mamaroneck High School. Happy to speak anywhere else. Um, in New York City, we work very closely with, uh, um, it's a coalition of different groups called Transfer to Careers. And so um, lots of members of the HOPE team go out and recruit in high schools for our programming all the time. One of the programs that we run that I didn't mention um, is a youth build program. So youth build is a national or actually international model um, for 18 to 24 year olds who have not gotten their high school equivalency. They come through our program, they get their high school equivalency. They also get work readiness training. They also get certifications and then they get placed in internships and ultimately careers in horticulture and construction. Um, so we do a lot of recruitment in high schools, um, specifically like the transfer schools and alternative schools in the high school. Um, but in, in New York City, um, but happy happy to go. I don't think anyone, a high school kid really wants to hear from me though, um, but happy to send a way more compelling staff member that uh, that will connect better. No, I disagree. You both are <laughs> amazing speakers and any, any high school student would be lucky. Um, do we have any other questions? Do we have any other questions? I, I was just gonna make a statement. Okay. I, I, I just like that have, have to be in school. I think it would, you know, Heather also talked I really think that building um, environmental tracks in our schools where kids can decide they want jobs in all these things you've mentioned, and from ninth grade through 12th grade, they can learn about those jobs, go out and fill into those jobs, and then graduate with those jobs instead of worrying about the $90,000 a year it's going to cost them to party. <laughs> um, you know, and they, and, they would be, and they would be helping the environment and, and feeling good about themselves and leaving school with a job, you know, I, I think it's something that we should be thinking about. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Youth Build program, which is like a national model, thinks very seriously about that and at, um, because right now, again, we're living in a moment where like the future is these green jobs that don't necessarily require a bachelor's degree. Um, we've kind of all been socialized to believe that that's like the end all be all, but there are many different pathways that people can take to do really amazing things and provide for their family and contribute to their community. Um, and so I do think that is like a important and powerful conversation uh, to be having. Yeah. Um, so I uh, apologize that we have to uh, end our event tonight, but before we um, before we end it, just wanted to, again, thank you both for being here. You guys were amazing. I um, hope the audience learned a ton. Um, again, we want to thank all of our partners from the Westchester County Board of Legislatures to the um, all the various libraries and again to uh, Rye Library for hosting us. Um, CURE can only do this type of stuff. Um, through the generous donations of our neighbors and our communities. So please consider making a donation. Um, our website is www.learnwithcure.com. Um, if you want to get interested in anything that we're doing with programming or volunteering, we always need volunteers. Um, just like other nonprofits, we are a nonprofit and we are constantly looking for volunteers. Um, at the end of this event, you will be getting a survey uh, in the email. Um, oftentimes, we'll also send a follow-up email with um, resources and even any uh, um, opportunities you might come up with with things that our community can do. Um, and then finally, um, our next event is on February 27th at Harrison Library at 2.30 p.m. on Sunday, where they're going to be talking about Chapter 10, the Solidarity Dividend with a phenomenal panel. And thank you. Mm -hmm.